pandemic is, is great in my opinion. And her specialty, of course, is geology, but with a particular emphasis. You know, some geologists, it's all about the chemistry and the details of how does the magma, of course she knows that. But her specialty is the effects on people, on infrastructure, hazards, and a little bit about risk. So naturally, when American Samoa um, started having a lot of earthquakes, she um, was, was quite happy to be invited to go down with, with her team to investigate the situation since it uh, hadn't erupted in a long time. And the concern, of course, was not just the nature of the volcano, but its impact on people. So how about an applause to welcome Thank you so much for being here, and thank you, Darcy, for that lovely introduction. So tonight, it's going to be about American Samoa's volcanoes. Um, but there will be one slide about what's happened at Kilauea today, <laughs> just because <laughs> probably people are curious. Um, I just want to point out, as you were up, it's 6 o'clock this morning, and you saw the person sneaking off the webcam up there. <laughs> that was Natalia. That, she was <laughs> that was not me, but I was up. <laughs> No, uh, I did not feature on a live stream this morning. <laughs> All right, and we'll keep that a secret who it was. <laughs> um, anyways, um, apart from the very last minute thing I've added about today's events, um, what we'll be covering today is why there are volcanoes in, in American Samoa, what happened a year and a half ago, um, what might a future eruption in American Samoa look like, then we'll look at the three main volcanoes there a little bit more in depth. And then I'll end with what the USGS is doing in American Samoa now and going forward. So the main take homes is that American Samoa, just like Hawaii, is built on volcanoes. And each volcano is thought to have erupted in the Holocene, so the last 10,000 years or so. Future eruptions are very likely, but generations can pass between these. So it's something that is a rare occurrence in terms of the human experience, but it most likely will happen again in the future. We don't know when. And um, the USGS is working with local communities and local officials. We have built a volcano and earthquake monitoring network, and a lot of the credit for that goes to Jefferson Chang. And we are also doing scientific research to better understand the volcanoes of American Samoa so we can better prepare for when something happens again in the future. Maybe not in our lifetimes, but it's important to be prepared. So this is a slide I finished at 540, so it might be a little bit outdated, I don't know. Um, so what happened at Kilauea today, the last eruption was in September, and it's been an unrest since, but things really ramped up within the last 24 hours. So just before midnight, the earthquake started to increase, and at 3 a.m. it became really quite elevated. And with some other monitoring parameters, it's quite clear that magma is on the move. At 4.41 a.m. this morning, we raised the alert level in the aviation color code, so it's still at watch and warning. And if you want to uh, receive notices uh, when we do change these, uh, you can sign up at the, um, the website listed there. And while there hasn't been, as far as I'm aware, magma seen at the surface yet, field crews such as myself uh, have felt quite a few earthquakes and heard and seen quite a few rock falls into Halema'uma'u. So on the top uh, right there, I have a photo I took this morning at 6.45 a.m. of a rock fall. Um, so this followed an earthquake, and you can see the the rock fall here it lasted about two minutes, which is quite a long time for a rock fall. Um, we felt the earthquake that um, happened right before it started. This map here shows the earthquakes that have happened since midnight. I, I did this at 5.40, so there's been some more. Um, so you can see there's been 514 earthquakes in that time period that were located, a lot more that were not too small to locate. And here is a 24-hour uh, look at what's happening. So each row covers four hours. Um, each, there's these sub rows within each row, and that's a different seismometer. Um, 
where you see these lines, those are earthquakes. So when they're picked up across all of uh, the seismometers shown here, it's definitely an earthquake. Blue is lower energy, red is higher energy. You can see it was blue for a while. Um, and then it's been really red recently. So this just shows just how energetic it's been. And either this is a really big intrusion event happening or there will be an eruption. We're not quite sure yet at this stage. But this has been what a lot of HVO has been focused on on the last 24 hours. And that's all I'm going to talk about Kilauea for today. Uh, so I thought I would start a little bit about me. So I'm a volcanologist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Since August 2022, I've been the co-leader for HBO work in American Samoa. But I am neither American Samoan nor Hawaiian. I'm from Belgium, and I uh, immigrated to the US as a child, grew up in New Jersey. I fell in love with volcanoes in college and am so grateful to have a job doing what I love. And before joining HBO, I spent eight years in Aotearoa, New Zealand, at the equivalent of the USGS. I focus on volcanic hazards and also eruption consequences for both the environment and people. Um, and these are the two important cats of my life, Rose and Colonel Mustard. All right, so a little bit about American Samoa. Um, it's been inhabited for over 3,000 years. And I can't emphasize enough how important Fa'a Samoa way of life is. Um, it's a, a way of life that revolves around family, faith, and a chieftain system. There are four populated islands in the territory. Um, there is also Western Samoa, which I will not really be touching on today, uh, which is an independent country. So. Um, American Samoa was annexed by the US in 1900. Legally, it's an unincorporated, unorganized territory. Um, but in reality, it's organized with governor as the head of government. Um, the 2020 census showed there's just under 50,000 people who live there. Um, most of them are on the main island of Tutuila. There is less than 1,000 in uh, the Manua Islands. In terms of where it is, uh, this is a map of the Pacific. Hawaii is over here. American Samoa is there. New Zealand is in, uh, further south, if that helps situate. So the USGS um, has five volcano observatories. Um, looking a little bit bigger picture, there's 161 volcanoes in the US, uh, spread across 13 states and two territories. And we have five volcano observatories that look over them. So the USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is a volcano observatory not only for Hawaii, but also for American Samoa. We work with communities to prepare for volcanic eruptions. We uh, do real-time monitoring, which was very active this morning at Kilauea. Uh, we disseminate forecasts and notifications about what's happening at our volcanoes. We assess hazards, and we conduct scientific research. So all of the observatories do all that for uh, the volcanoes in their area of responsibility. So the first question I posed was, why are there volcanoes in American Samoa? So they, there are volcanoes here because of the Samoan hotspot. So this is just like the Hawaiian Islands. There's the Hawaii hotspot for the volcanoes here and the Samoan hotspot for American Samoa. This map may feel a little bit complicated, um, but it shows the hot spots of the Pacific Ocean. So wherever you see a, um, a circle, a black circle, that's where the hot spots are right now. And the lines that uh, leave them are where the hot spot used to be. The color of the line shows when that uh, track was active. So if it's blue, that means it's in the last 43 million years. And you can see a lot of them have this kink right about uh, at 43 million years, and that's when the Pacific plate um, shifted direction of motion. So um, the Samoan hotspot is uh, right here. Um, but you can see there, there's a lot of hotspots in the Pacific. So it's one of many. 
but it's a little bit more complicated than some of the other hotspots. Um, and this is a bit outside my area of expertise. I hope you won't ask me too many questions about it. But it's a hotspot that is uh, going towards a trench. Um, and this is more of an issue for independent Samoa, but there's some interesting interactions between the hotspot and the trench, uh, which make that uh, even though uh, independent Samoa volcanoes are much older, there has been quite a bit more recent activity. So the veneer of the, those islands are much more uh, young than you might anticipate for, hot, for a volcano of those ages. Um, in American Samoa, it's still more just purely the hotspot. But if we look at the whole hotspot vol uh, volcanoes, it is, there is this odd interaction with the Tongan Trench. So if we look at the volcanoes of American Samoa, the islands are actually the tops of shield volcanoes. So most of the volcanoes are underwater. And there's a, quite a few volcanoes that have not breached the surface. So we can see here um, Tutuila volcano. And again, this is where the vast majority of American Samoa uh, folks live. And then Ofu, Olusenga volcano, and Ta'u volcano. But again, these are just the very at uh, the tips of quite large volcanic edifices. There's also Vailulu'u Seamount, which is submarine, um, that will breach the surface at some point, probably, but not for a very long time. If we look at when they were last um, active, so Tutuila erupted at least once, maybe twice in the last 1,600 years. If we go to Ofulusenga, that last erupted in 1866 AD, and there are eyewitness accounts of that. It was, uh, fortunately, as far as I'm aware, no one died. It was offshore, but it was quite dramatic, uh, the accounts of it. And then Ta'u volcano, we don't know when it last erupted, probably in the Holocene. It, it was in unrest in 2022. And then finally, the seamount, it last erupted in 2003. Um, and it is the one that has the most eruptions lately. So I'm briefly going to discuss what happened in 2022. And maybe you have, you're unaware that something happened in 2022. So you'll be on this journey with us because it, it was quite a journey. So let me set the stage before July 2022. At that time, there was no volcano monitoring and no seismic equipment for any uh, real-time purposes in American Samoa. The USGS had done a threat assessment and had uh, identified there were three volcanoes in American Samoa, but they were all deemed low threat. So for example, Mauna Loa and Kilauea, those are very high threat volcanoes. This is not the, there's um, a ranking even lower than low threat, but this is um, pretty low out there. Um, it would be generous to say that there was a minimal USGS presence. I would say there was no presence. Um, the last witness eruption was in 1866. It was um, offshore of Olusenga. So if we look at this map here, this shows American Samoa. We have Tutuila, the Manua Islands of Ofulusenga and Ta'u. Here's a, a blow up of that map, and this is about where that eruption had happened, the 1866 eruption. But there had been some submarine eruptions at uh, Vailulu'u. Again, that's at Seamount the, on the east um, in the 70s, the 90s, and the 2000s. Uh, again, I would say it, it would be generous to say that there was minimal awareness that American Samoa's volcanoes could erupt again. And there's a really good reason for that. They don't erupt very often. Um, and there's other hazards that are much more pressing. So tsunamis, there was a tsunami in 2009 that killed at least 39 people and pretty much affected everyone. There are earthquakes, there's hurricanes. Um, there are things that are much more pressing in terms of um, the mental load you can bear in terms of what hazards you can keep track of. So that's the situation in July 2022. 
at the end of July, uh, the earthquake started. So again, there is no seismometers, uh, but there are a lot of humans out there, and they were human seismometers. After a couple of days of shaking, uh, people notified the National Weather Service in uh, Pango Pango. And within a few days, the USGS was notified. Um, it took many, um, it was a bit of a phone tree, like something's happening, we don't know what to do, who should we talk to? And finally, the USGS got involved. Around that time, uh, the American Samoa Department of Homeland Security got involved, and all this while, the earthquakes are getting, there's more of them, and they're getting stronger or, or more noticeable. The felt seismicity peaked in mid-August and ended by mid-September. Some of these earthquakes had a, a really loud sound associated with them as well. The response to these earthquakes included uh, the community, of course, and uh, local, territorial, and federal partners. This was extremely stressful for people in the Manua Islands, uh, especially at night when you couldn't see the ocean and when you can feel the earthquakes better because generally you feel the earthquakes quite nicely when you are seated or lying down. We had no idea during this whether or not an eruption would eventuate. Um, fortunately, it did not, but it could have maybe gone another way and it, I would be telling a very different story. Thankfully, there was no eruption that eventuated. If we look um, at the, the data we have, um, I'll start with this uh, image on the left. So again, this is a map of the Pacific. American Samoa is here. I'm gonna draw your attention to Wake Island, which is quite far away. But Wake Island at that time had an array of effectively undersea micro, uh, underwater microphones. And because of the way they were oriented and because of physics I don't understand, um, they could actually pick up the earthquakes. They couldn't tell you the location of the earthquakes, um, but they could provide a count. And so this is a count of the number of earthquakes that were detected by the Wake Island Array. In gray here is when we had uh, no monitoring network, and in dark gray is when we had a monitoring network to locate the earthquakes. Um, this map on the right is for those earthquakes in dark gray that we were able to locate. So you can see um, Ofo Lasang over here, Ta over here, and most of the earthquakes, well, all the earthquakes were offshore to the north. The largest magnitude was a magnitude 4.5. Uh, this only shows the earthquakes that were magnitude uh, 2.5 or bigger. Um, so there are over 300 earthquakes in this period. This was quite a unique response. Uh, for the USGS, we were starting from absolutely nothing. No one knew who we were. We didn't have that local trust yet. We had no presence. We had no monitoring network. We had no hazard maps. We had very limited understanding of uh, what past activity was like. And at the start, we didn't even know which volcano was responsible. So that's a very humbling experience. Um, this is also extremely unusual for any volcano observatory around the world. Most volcano observatories, even if um, they have limited networks, they have that presence, and we did not have that presence. These are also very remote islands at that time. And most of the time, there's only two flights a week from Hawaii to American Samoa, and then going out to the Manua Islands is even um, more challenging. Um, there's also two languages. So I would say most American Samoans understand English, and many, many, many are very comfortable in it. But Samoa is the primary language in the Manua Islands, um, and so we had to be able to provide information in both languages, and for that we really leaned heavily on the National Weather Service. There's also cultural factors. I'm not Samoan. Um, none of the team was Samoan, and we were going in saying, trust us, we can help, um, which is hard, very hard, and again, the National Weather Service was key for um, opening doors. Uh, there's also political and historical contexts. This is an unincorporated territory. Um, 
I'm not a, a sociologist or much of a historian, but uh, you can imagine that there can be some factors associated with that. And finally, COVID-19 was still a factor. It was very stressful going to the airport and getting swabbed and knowing that if you were positive, you would be uh, stuck in the airport pretty much for two weeks or whatever it was. So things went well though. So one of the incredible achievements is that we were able to build a monitoring network from scratch in two weeks. Um, and again, Jefferson Chang and also um, Marcus at the National Weather Service uh, are the, really important to that. Uh, so I was the first person to arrive and I brought with me uh, these quite primitive seismometers called Raspberry Shakes. And within uh, 48 hours, we had them installed in the Manua Islands, or two of them. And less than 24 hours later, we, we were able to rule out Bailulu'u, which had been um, a strong candidate for what was happening, at least locally, um, and saying, no, this is actually much closer. This is in the Manua Islands. Reinforcements came uh, shortly thereafter with four broadband seismometers and accelerometers and more raspberry shakes. And within two weeks, um, all four broadband, no, uh, three of the broadbands were deployed. The fourth was later deployed in, Pango, um, in Tutuila. Um, one second. And it was providing real-time telemeter data, which that was a huge accomplishment in itself. In September, we were able to deploy two uh, GPS stations and these instruments are still working in December of the, uh, 2020 and uh, last month, uh, we did return to American Samoa to service the network. So now there are four broadband seismometers in American Samoa, one on Tutuila and three in the Manua Islands uh, that are complemented with a Raspberry Shake network or supplemented by. I should say that uh, this is a photo of Jefferson installing this seismometer over here, and you can see um, we had really important local support. It was hot. Um, and this is Marcus installing the first seismometer um, in a school in uh, Fitiuta. So that was the first shake that we installed. Uh, we built and strengthened uh, partnerships across many levels of government. So again, this response included a wide range of folks. The good thing is that roles were very clearly defined. There were daily EOC meetings which provided a focal point to share information. Uh, the USGS was also uh, very graciously invited to observe some, or be at some of the cabinet meetings and to observe some of the exercises. The territorial government coordinated the community meetings. Usually these meetings had USGS and NOAA, EOC and the um, American Samoan Department of Health along with the National Weather Service. So this is a photo uh, right before our first trip to the Manua Islands. Um, uh, this is Eleanor from the National Weather Service. I can't overstate how important she is. She opened up many doors for us. So what kind of volcanic activity can we expect in American Samoa? So most of the time, nothing, which is great. Uh, so most of the time, these volcanoes are at normal and green, almost all of the time. Sometimes it does go into volcanic unrest, as it happened in 2022. And as we saw there, this does not guarantee an eruption. Sometimes the volcano will decide to go back to sleep. Uh, so when it's in unrest, and it's at advisory in yellow. When you get an eruption, there are three main types of eruptions we can expect. One is a submarine eruption, and up here we have a cartoon of a, a rendition of what a submarine eruption could look like in cross-section. Sometimes the material can reach the ocean surface, sometimes it's completely contained by the ocean. We can get dry eruptions on land. Um, so this would be in an, in an area where there isn't too much groundwater, it's not coastal and it will form a cinder cone and uh, lava flows, some other hazards as well. Um, but the worst case scenario is what we would call wet eruptions. So this would be either on the coast um, or in a place with lots of groundwater and you would get something that looks like that. So 
Um, there can be surges that uh, has huge life safety implications and the products can go some distance. There's evidence that these all have happened. So if we just look at Ta'u, you can see uh, Falea Sal, this is uh, one of the villages, it's within a tuff cone. So that's an evidence of a past wet eruption. If you look on the landscape, you can see all these little cinder cones. I sometimes call them pimples. Um, so these are evidence of past dry eruptions. You can also see this huge scarp here. This is a landslide scarp. I'll be talking about that uh, when we get to the volcano more specifically. So a cartoon rendition of what might happen. Um, again, you can get, this is for Hawaii. It doesn't really show well what a wet eruption would look like, but it's really similar volcanic hazards to Hawaii. Uh, so cinder corn formation, tephra, vog, gases, lava flows, um, interactions with the ocean that are more explosive and so forth. So that's what happened in 2022. I'm now going to just do a little vignette on each volcano, what we know so far. And we are going to start with Tutuila. So Tutuila is a shield volcano. It may be erupted around 1200 CE, um, but it definitely erupted um, within the last 1600 years. This is a, a Google image of the island and then a more topographic view of the island. You can see it is heavily eroded. Um, but also, you can also see these features, these tuff cone features and cinder cones. And this is a tough cone as well. So this is just some uh, photos of what it looks like when you're there. This is um, Anu'u, so that tough cone on the east side. Um, you can see it's just offshore. There, this is one of the, this is the smallest of the four populated islands. But a lot of it is um, eroded interiors of volcanoes and lava flows as well. This is um, the main map that we have for Tutuila. It is from Stearns, who you may be familiar with for his work here. And this is from 1944. So we are working on updating this. Um, the, if we look at the top, this is uh, looking at the different ages of rocks on the surface. The pink is the youngest. So, and then, um, Red are the interior of uh, eroded volcanoes and dikes as well. And then um, the other colors are volcanic rocks, mostly lava flows going from uh, this orange and then going eastward. Um, this is a cross section that Stearns put together. When we look along this line going here, so it's as though we, someone just took a slice through the earth and what do you see? So what Stearns has suggested is that the Leone Volcanics, which is this youngest um, area, it's actually more of a veneer on um, reefs and older sediments. We can then see this eroded volcano in the interior plug. Um, a lot of stuff has been eroded. And then as we go further north, this is another um, shield volcano. Uh, you can see another plug as we go towards um, the north there, and then reefs and sediment that are building onto the volcano. Um, I'd say that the general concepts here are probably right, but there's a lot that we uh, can now say um, so many decades later. This is something that uh, Drew Downs and I are working on right now. So when was the last eruption? Again, we probably have had two in the last 1600 years, the Leone Volcanics here. Um, the Leone Volcanics have lava flows. They have some scoria cones and also some tough cones at the coast. So again, scoria cones are more those dry eruptions and tough cones are those wet eruptions. And there's also ash around. There's, uh, the people who've done the most work on this are actually archeologists. 
um, not geologists. So David Addison in particular has done quite a bit of work on it. And um, this is, if we look at this map of Tutuila, there's a star right here. Uh, this is an area where David Addison has um, done some dating. Um, so we can see here that there's a layer with cultural deposits. So this um, may be ceramics, for example. Um, and then there is volcanic ash. And there's also some charcoal. And so this was actually something that David was able to date. Um, there's also, there's, because there's the cultural deposits underneath and also um, people dug through it, it's quite clear that people were there before and after. Um, unclear, if I'm, we're guessing that people lived during as well, but that's a little bit harder to confirm. Um, so that's what we know about the Leone volcanics. Anu'u, which is all the way over here, it looks young. That's all we can say right now. We had hoped to go out to see if we could collect some samples when we were there in August uh, 2023, but um, the ocean was a bit rough. Moving on to Ofu Lusenga, um, it's also a shield volcano. This has that witnessed eruption from 1866. Um, well, I should say going back real quick, uh, it's thought that Tutuila is about 1.5 million years old, that volcano. This is much younger. This is 440,000 years old or so. Um, th these show a satellite image and a, a more topographic map of what Ofu Lusenga looks like. And it's a stunning place, absolutely stunning. So here we actually see um, Ofu is here, Olusang is here, and then this is Ta'u. Um, and then you can see these rocks here. This is the same rocks, but looking from the other direction. The uh, map thing here is maybe a little bit more recent from the late 60s. So plate tectonics was just barely a thing. Um, and these geologic maps, um, there's a lot of work to be done. I'll just leave it at that. Um, there's clearly a lot of dikes. So all of these uh, lines that are darker here are exposed dikes. Um, there's different ages of volcanics, it appears. And I really I like, love this cross section here, which shows um, a guess as to how much has been eroded away. So this has been really eroded quite a bit. There's a lot of text here and it looks really old timey and that's because it is. This is the um, best eyewitness account that we have of the eruption in 1866. In purple is when there are dates and then in um, blue are some of the more um, interesting geological things I will say this narrative is um, reflective of its time. There's some unfortunate descriptions of the people who lived on Ofu and Olusenga. Um, it's what we have, unfortunately. Um, but so here uh, on the 7th of September, there was a lot of earthquakes that started of all of a sudden. Two days later on the 9th, um, really ramped up. And then on the 12th, you, there was a commotion that was observed in the ocean. Uh, it appeared like a surf breaking over a sudden uh, sunken rock. And that's when it was clear at daylight that there was an eruption going on. First, there was a couple of explosions an hour, but then it got uh, more intense. And um, soon there was mud and dense columns of material that went up to 2,000 feet in the air. You couldn't see Olosenga from Ta'u, and that's a bit unusual. Um, they didn't see any flame, so everything was subdued by the ocean, the lava, or covered by the ocean. But the ocean had a light sulfur tinge for 10 miles round. Um, people had to move uh, from the, the closest point of the eruption. There's just, it was un very unpleasant. There's three days of this, then it, it died down. But again, this is in September and in November, that's when it was said that maybe there was, activity had really diminished by that point. 
So it's a really Im impressive account of a two-month-ish long eruption with a five days-ish of onset. Um, again, not on land, offshore, submarine, really well contained by the ocean, but it still sent ash quite a height. Um, and was sounds terrifying to live through. There was a NOAA cruise um, a while back that did a, a bathymetric survey, so that's like an underwater topographic map. And this is uh, the best guess we have as to where that 1866 vent is. There's that landform under the ocean, and it's the right distance from the accounts. Moving on to Ta'u, um, also a shield volcano. Now it's 70,000 years old. It, we think it probably erupted in the Holocene, but we don't have a definitive date. Um, this is what it looks like. This is um, the tough cone in Faliasau. So here we can see a little bit of it as well. This is just uh, the cliff though. You can see the, the various layers in a lot more detail. The mapping here also dates to the late 60s. Um, these little, th these look like bugs to me, but these are all the different cinder cones that have been mapped. Um, you can see there's these different formations. At the time, it, I think they interpreted what is clearly a landslide to our eye, modern eyes or more modern eyes. Um, they interpreted it as that caldera, but it's, that's incorrect. Um, there was some recent uh, work by some people who care a lot about big landslides and they dated it, this landslide to about 22,000 years ago. Um, so that definitely took a sizable chunk and presumably it's the deposits are off shore now. We had a, a Christine Tomnico. She worked with uh, Drew Downs and myself this summer. She is from Tutuila. She graduated from the American uh, Samoa Community College and also from UH Hilo. And the question that we asked her was, Okay, so we know if there's an eruption in the Manua Islands, it will be bad for, it will be very unpleasant for the people of Manua, um, probably. But could it also affect the people in Tutuila? So this is um, 60 miles away. Um, and so she did modeling with ASH 3D, um, looking at different um, column heights and seasons, different times of years had different wind patterns. And she was able to get ash to Tutuila, but it took a really tall eruption. Um, so most of the time, it seems like the gas and ash impacts would be contained to the Manua Islands. But in a really serious situation, it could also affect the whole territory. Um, and while gas and ash impacts don't, uh, of the amount she was able to model, don't generally pose a life safety risk. It is really scary and really unpleasant. And that would be a lot more people than just the people, the Manua Islands who would be impacted. So Christine did great. I hope that we'll never see the situations that she has modeled. I'll end uh, looking at our, our volcano tour with Vailulu'u. Uh, this is the submarine volcano. Um, it is presently about just under uh, half a mile under the sea surface. Uh, and it is the youngest volcano of the Samoan hotspot. It's erupted three times in the last uh, 50 years. And this is a beautiful topographic, uh, a bath bathymetric um, rendition of this volcano. So there have been some repeat surveys here. And this is uh, what the summit area looked like in 1999, in 2005, 2012, and uh, 2017. And you can see between 1999 and 2005, this appears. So this is what was produced in the eruption in uh, 2003. Um, people who do uh, big sea surveys, um, often care quite a bit about the biology. I'm not a biologist, but this is an image I found quite interesting that looked at how quickly 
um, life goes back on these volcanoes after they've erupted. Um, I can't tell you any more than what that image shows. Okay, so currently um, what we're doing is we monitor all the volcanoes of American Samoa. HVO looks more after uh, the volcano side and the National Earthquake Center um, monitors where the earthquakes are happening. Um, the seismic equipment that we have installed, it's not just important for volcanoes, but it's also really important for the PTWC, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. This really fills a big gap um, that there previously was. So it allows for uh, faster locations of earthquakes in this part of the world um, that the PTWC uh, looks after. So it's not just, uh, the network we have set up is not just for volcanoes, it's for earthquake and tsunami as well. Just like here, uh, we provide volcano alert levels for people on the ground and the aviation color code for airplanes. Um, the National Weather Service translated uh, both of these uh, schema into Samoan. They were able to do this before we did the initial setting and very grateful for that. Um, so it's exactly the same system as we use in Hawaii and actually all the volcanoes in the US. We issue the same products um, that we issue in Hawaii, so volcano activity notices when something big is happening, like an alert level change, like was issued at Kilauea this morning. Uh, scheduled updates, so the first Thursday of every month, if it's at uh, normal and green, which we hope it will be for a very long time, we just uh, push a, a summary of what has happened in the past month. Um, and we also issue the same sorts of products that we issue here in Hawaii. You can subscribe for the, if you really want to learn more about what's happening at the volcanoes, either in American Samoa or any US volcano. This is the one that was issued in January. Um, so it's one uh, monthly update for the three volcanoes we monitor there. Um, usually it's quite short because it's been thankfully very quiet lately. The National Earthquake Information Center um, is charged with locating earthquakes. So if, if there's a magnitude five earthquake or, or greater, they will publish um, the location within 20 minutes. For smaller earthquakes, they can take up to 10 weeks. Um, but here, they, it shows the threshold at which they will publish a location. <coughs> so the NEIC is based in Golden, Colorado. Uh, I'll say that for uh, Hawaiian earthquakes, it's actually HVO that does the location. Uh, we have that authority for Hawaii, but for um, American Samoa, it's done out of Golden. So, uh, what we covered this evening is why there's a volcanoes in American Samoa. It's hotspot volcanoes. What happened in 2022? There was unrest and we very rapidly had to respond to it. Uh, huge thanks to the National Weather Service for facilitating a lot of our work. We looked at what future options might look like. So most of the time, nothing, thankfully. Um, could get submarine eruptions, could get uh, dry eruptions on land. We really hope to never see a coastal eruption. Those are the most um, dangerous. Um, we had a brief look at each volcano and what the USGS does in terms of monitoring. So I'll leave it at that and happy to take any questions. So the question was, so we installed, there was the seismicity a year and a half ago. We have the network now. What has happened since? Mm -hmm. um, and nothing. The last earthquake um, that we've located, so that only earthquakes above a magnitude 2.5 are located. 
So the last earthquake was, um, I believe, October 6, 2022. Um, when Jefferson was there in uh, December, so now about two months ago, um, he was talking with people and there w it seemed like there was one fault earthquake in the Manua Islands recently-ish, but it wasn't uh, big enough to be located. So a raspberry shake is um, a rudimentary seismometer. So we can put it, install it quite quickly, and um, there are much less stringent site requirements than for a broadband seismometer. So a broadband seismometer generally we bury in the ground. Um, you would not bury a raspberry shake. This is more to be used in schools, for example, or in buildings um, connected to a Wi-Fi uh, sorry, directly connected into the internet. Um, so for example, if you go to a museum and you're invited to shake and see the waveforms, it's probably using the same sort of technology. Um, so a raspberry shake is not used by the National Earthquake Information Center, for example, to locate earthquakes. For that, we rely on broadbands. Um, but because it's so easy to install, and we just needed basic information to get an idea of where these earthquakes were located, it was really useful. Um, Jefferson does have a, a stock of these, and I believe either he's planning or there are some installed in schools in Hawaii, uh, but it's really useful for outreach. Generally, it's used for outreach, not for monitoring like we had to do. I'm not one of the monitor, uh, the network designers. My understanding is that we're not, four is quite a bit actually. Um, unfortunately, the volcanoes are all small and in a line, so we, it makes it a little bit harder to um, have a really robust network. Ideally, you would have seismometers all over wherever the earthquakes are happening. Um, they're also really expensive, so um, for now, having four seismometers is huge, four broadband seismometers, and the raspberry shakes just complement out the network. But there are no plans at this stage to replace the raspberry shake network um, with more broadbands. It's also like they're in places like in a school or in a clinic, um, in a, a store, and these are not places that are suitable for broadbands just because there's so much human, uh, human traffic, or like foots and human activity. Uh, we monitor Hawaii with broadbands, but there are raspberry shakes for educational purposes. <laughs> yes, yeah, so a great thing about the raspberry shake um, shakes is that you can um, immediately go to this website, um, and that was huge in American Samoa because people could see the earthquakes that were happening, and it, it's really validating to see data reflect your lived experience. I'm glad that was super clear. <laughs> Zero. It is a very different context um, than here. I feel really fortunate to have been able to be in those, be there and serve the communities of American Samoa. So the, the tourists that you take on your way out, and if you enjoy this talk and want to see more, I believe um, USGS has these up on YouTube, uh, the causes and, and, and past presentations of volcano awareness. Sorry, one more thing. Again, this was the last talk of Volcano Awareness Month. Thank you for participating in them. Thank you, huge thank you to UH Hilo for hosting and also for the National Park for 
all the work they did there. Um, I think in all between um, USGS and National Park, there were 17 events, so quite a lot. Um, so thank you all for participating and see you next year.